Okay. All right. So welcome back. Um, okay. I think there was a question uh, which I didn't notice, and I think I will we'll just uh, handle it after I just finish this part of the the. Um, which we'll just, just complete this. What makes a good husband and wife team? So we were we were looking at what. Uh, what does it mean to be a good team player? So by being a good team player means to communicate better. Uh, it means uh, to be able to take feedback better. It means to not be defensive when there is feedback. Um, or uh, yeah, so these were uh, two, three things that we spoke about. We also, yeah, and we also did say that it is um, uh, uh, working together rather than being independent from one another. Okay. The other two, what else does it uh, make about a team player is when you are making the commitment to do your part, to pitch in with your part, okay, uh, and uh, uh, not not leaving everything, uh, you know, not being slack uh, or not uh, being not procrastinating what you need to do, but you're putting in your commitment about carrying the part of uh, the responsibility that you are you know, that that you are to do next is uh, not being concerned uh, who gets the credit so sometimes when you're in a team uh, it could be that one person gets the credit for or, or gets the recognition for something that's gone well okay uh, remember that the, the credit is not going to an individual but the credit is for the entire team so not looking at it or not feeling a sense of rejection when there is a, a credit or a recognition that goes to one person. Okay, um, you're also in working together as a team when you're sharing in the strength of one another. When you are building on someone else's strength, and so what happens is you have a greater strength. Okay, or when you are supporting one another in weakness especially when there is weakness in one or when one person is trying to get better at something uh, usually another team member finding fault or pointing fingers at their weakness could be uh, could be a dampener could be something that doesn't help in working towards uh, towards that opportunity to grow together okay so some of the things that we said is we make every effort uh, when when the team members are making eff effort to walk together in unity, when you're respecting each other's differences, when you are playing the roles that's been assigned to you, when you're sharing interests and uh, pursuing something that is common, when you're becoming a good uh, team player, when you're sharing in, in the strengths of one another, and you're supporting to build each other despite the weaknesses that are there. So that's what that's what are some of the factors of becoming a good husband and wife team. Okay, I'll just uh, look at the question that's come up. So I think Jackins written the question. So is being defensive more like blaming each other instead of acknowledging and looking forward to the solution? So if we have differences of thought or opinion at that moment, do we remain silent? Can you explain more on this? Okay, I'm just going to read that again. So is being defensive more like blaming each other? instead of acknowledging and looking forward to the solution. Okay, So let me uh, uh, try and tackle that. So being defensive and blaming each other are probably two different things. Being defensive would probably look like, um, no, that's not why I did it. I did it because of maybe your defense can come when you're putting uh, the um, the source on something else also so let's probably take an example um jackin can you bring an example and so then maybe we could we could talk about the example because i'm not able to get an example right away is that an example you can talk you can bring about uh, yeah so when it comes to the child and when something yeah. goes wrong with the child so yeah. I think of it in a different way and he thinks of it in a very different way Okay. So like maybe like buying things for her at when she hits teenage. So I would think like maybe she can wait or like you will think, okay, and I, right now like she might need it. And, uh, you know, <laughs> an example that I can think of right now. Okay. So I thought like maybe she can manage with whatever she has, but uh, he'll think everyone has and then why can't we get her? 
So. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, so this this is probably a different, uh, for at least the example you've given me, is a different style in the way your differences of thought or opinion. I think that's what you said, right? There is a difference of thought or opinion. So there's there's an there's an additional thing to this. So there is a difference of opinion or thought in the way that you buy a certain gadget or certain luxuries for the child. One person thinks they should have it because all the other children of their age group has it. Another spouse thinks they shouldn't have it because of X, Y, Z reasons. Now, these are different kinds of opinions. Now, uh, the, the um, um, blaming each other or being defensive comes, I think, maybe at a later stage, all right? Like, for example, somehow the decision has been made to, let's say, buy this whatever gadget you want for your child. Okay? Suppose whoever, you all have come decision, okay, fine, let's, let's just leave it, right? Now, when there is, a, let's say, a problem occurs, maybe your child is using their phone or whatever, I'm just taking an example, I don't particularly know what the issue is, but um, if, let's say the child is using the phone beyond the time that you all have stipulated for the child. Maybe you all have said one hour a day, and maybe the child uses it for one and a half, two hours. And so the other parent or the other spouse comes in and says, see, I did tell you that this is why I gave you this reason why we shouldn't get a gadget. Okay, now this is all your fault, and this is what is the problem right so this is what blaming happens okay so this this is generally what it looks like blaming now when does it get defensive when the other person says um yeah i have been i i uh, you know i have told her and she, and uh, she doesn't listen that's because you're not following the rules that i am that i have put so there is a defense and there is a counter blame right so what happens is the focus is a lot more on the problem than on saying, OK, we made this decision about this. There is no point us trying to point fingers as to who is at fault and why this decision was a bad decision. We are here where it is. Let's look at how we can do this ahead. So the couple sits together and says, OK, maybe we should stipulate a certain time share this with the daughter and say that there will be certain consequences like this, which means here again, there are going to be differences of opinions and ideas, but coming together with a strategy to work this out. So the defense and blame comes when maybe like these decisions aren't taken, both haven't taken the commitment to say, okay, we're deciding against this and this is our decision rather than we, we spoke about this, but this is your decision, not that I'm very happy with it. Then it doesn't become a team. It, it becomes more divided because that, the minute that a problem comes about, then there is this um, finger pointing or there is this blaming or there is this place of being defensive. Okay. So, so, I, so, uh, so did you understand? Did you pick that up, Jackie? Yeah, it was it was very clear. It's like more or less this is what happens. So like when at that point in time, mm -hmm. when I want to say something and then it doesn't happen, then then we think when something happens, it's because he should have listened. And that thought is just stays. Mm -hmm. so right. Now I understand that it is not about what I say or what he says. It's about we agreeing at that time. So we stick to that agreement. Right. Yeah. So that's yeah. the right thing. Yeah. Yeah. Thank yeah. You. yeah. Yeah. So you, you come to a place of agreement. So when you come to a place of agreement, sometimes maybe what you said is not what has worked, but you, you are willing to keep that as an agreement. And once you've said it's an agreement, it's an agreement, not falling back uh, on that. Okay. And I think you asked for another question. So if we have differences of thought or opinion at that moment, do we remain silent? Okay. So this again is is um i think it's again it's something uh, especially when we have differences of opinion about something we tend to take it extremely personally that okay when maybe my spouse has 
um, you know, crash down or cut down my opinion, it it's because they don't think my opinion is worth it or they think theirs is the best. It could it, it may not always be that. We tend to read it like that. But if we are able to read it and say, okay, they have a different way of seeing it. And so there may be two different ways of seeing a certain thing. If we are at a place of understanding that, then we are in a much gentler and calmer place to actually share our opinions and be willing to understand or put ourselves in the opinion that the other person has brought. We're a little bit more clearer in hearing that out. Okay, So if there is a difference of opinion, and if you're choosing to be silent, uh, you, you're you also giving a message that you're agreeing. Right? So at a later point of time, when something goes wrong, it may be unfair to say, OK, I didn't say anything at that time, but I was actually not very happy with it. But I just went along with it because you said it, it was better. Now, that is what, again, brings up conflicts. That's when we're not open in sharing our thoughts and our opinions about a certain thing. So um, if there is something that one may have of not being in agreeable to an opinion, it's good to sh share and say, you know, I don't completely see eye to eye on, on what you're saying. I see this differently. May I share my point of view? That's when you share your point of view. And coming to a place of looking at these different points of opinions as points of opinions and not related to, OK, this is what he said, this is what she said, and she always gets it done, he always gets it done. But looking at it as, what is the best way for us to work in this situation? specifically find a perspective of, of this like the ch right now the problem is the child and the phone not the problem is not okay he gets his way or she gets her way that's not the problem the problem is the child and the phone so you're focusing your attention more on the issue at hand rather than the people involved in the making of the opinion right so when you're able to keep that kind of a perspective um you're, you're, you're more objective in the way that you look at a solution. All right, Jack, and I hope that helped. OK, anyone else with any other thoughts or questions? OK, then we'll move on. Uh, we're going to be looking at what are important uh, heart attitudes for teamwork. Now, when we are in a team, um, there can be there can be some things that we do because we intellectually understand this is what we do in a team, right? Um, but if it doesn't come from the heart, if it doesn't come from deep within, we will definitely see a fallout in the way that uh, we work in a team. So the two important heart attitudes um, that that you know that we'd like to bring context here of the Bible, which is very scriptural, is to have the heart of a servant. Okay, to have a servant heart, and second is to be able to submit to one another, to mutually submit to one another. Okay, now a servant heart is something that we all know uh, who displayed in his walk on earth, that is, that is Jesus himself, right? Coming to a place to serve and not to be served, right? The, the Lord gave us his life in exchange for, for, um, for, our, for our sins, right? In exchange for what would could have happened to us. So he came to serve and not be served. So we look at a couple of scriptures and maybe, um, uh, then we'll we'll just unpack this. Can someone read Matthew chapter twenty verses twenty five to twenty eight? I'm on page ninety eight in the soft copy, or in the hard copy, it's page hundred. Can someone read 
Matthew 20, verses 25 to 28. <clears throat> Matthew 20, 25 28. So Jesus called them together to settle things down. He says, You have observed how God was rulers through their ways. Around how quickly a little power goes to their heads. It's not going to be that way with you. Whoever wants to be great must become a servant. Whoever wants to be first among you must be your uh, slave. That is what the Son of Man has done. He came to serve, not be served, and then to give away his life in exchange for the many who are held hostage. Thank you. Thank you, Nikhil. OK, so this is, um, uh, you know, G Jesus is bringing about um, what uh, what it means to be a servant. He's, he's sharing about what it means to be a, a, a servant. It says, whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave. And it, it brings a parallel about this is what the Son of Man has done. He came to serve, not to be served. And we see a lot of examples of this um, in the way that um, you know, Jesus came to serve. Um, even uh, with, among the disciples, he washed his feet um, and also you know, commanded us to go wash others' feet. He says, this is what I've done for you. This is what I've shown you how to do. Now do as I, as I do. Okay, so uh, so that's that's one of the things we understand when we are in a teamwork. It is to have the servant heart. So even when we've looked at the roles, we've seen uh, uh, the husband, even though he's the head and the leader of the home, he also must be a servant. Okay, um, both the husband and the wife maintain that servant heart and serve one another instead of always awaiting to be served because we are we're following the example of god jesus said i've laid a certain way for you go and do what i have done serve one another so what does this mean it is looking for the interests and the well-being of the other trying to serve each other according to their needs okay and this what would this mean when you're serving someone according to their needs it's probably a sacrifice that you may need to need to make and you are um, you're, you're keeping that heart of a servant as you're serving one another. And like I said, these could be in very many different aspects of life. And uh, uh, it could be, you know, in daily, um, uh, daily challenges or daily situations that you may be going through or maybe bigger ones. So the first one is having a servant heart. The second one is submission. And submission to one another, which is which is what we call as the mutual submission. Ephesians 5.21, we've read this earlier. It says, support, submit to yourselves to one another because of your reverence for Christ. Okay. And it, you know, the Bible does state that the husband is the head. We saw that in the uh, chapter on the roles. The husband is the head and the wife should be in submission to the husband. But we also see in scripture, the teaching that each one of us are to uh, walk in submission to one another. Why? Because of our worship of Christ, because of our reverence for Christ. So while the husband is the main leader of the home uh, um, and the wife may have other roles that she may be playing in, in, in everything together, especially in decision making, it is important to come together, discuss ideas, and come with the with the uh, with with the unified plan. And this, if that needs to happen, you need to submit to one another or yield to one another, which which could give it the best outcome. So the two heart attitudes, which come from the heart, is as Jesus spoke of a servant, the servant heart, and being yielded to one another or being in submission to one another. Okay, now we will look at a different aspect of uh, teamwork is what, how do you become a team together for God? 
in order to for for your for the kingdom use the goal of a um in a kingdom team you know the goal of a kingdom team is to support it's to encourage it is to empower each other to fulfill what god has ordained right so um uh, now it this this doesn't when we when we're talking about a kingdom team um we're saying that whatever god has put or ordained for each one of us to to um do that's what we support one another so this doesn't always mean that you know uh, uh, that the, that every time a husband and wife must get into you know, or you know a full time ministry or uh, you know getting into uh, doing the same things but by becoming a kingdom team we're saying that god has a call has a specific call for each of us uh, each for the husband as well as for the for the wife depending on what the gifting god has given to each one okay so the goal is for them for the husband and wife is to support one another encourage one another to fulfill that which god has planned or that which god has given for their lives so when you work together when you're working together for a similar purpose you extend the kingdom of god through their through your life even as individual people through your marriage and family um and and through what god has what what has put god has put for you okay so depending on the calling or the gifting that god has placed in your life you support one another and release them uh, into that so i mean there are so many examples we can think about and maybe i'd like to take a very varied example let's say one of the uh, one of the partners uh, maybe one let's say the husband is in a business okay and is working um, working in a business has a business of his own uh you know is financially quite successful uh and maybe let's say the wife is um and it's maybe a bible college teacher or or a teacher right so both of them uh, uh god has probably gifted them for two different things maybe the the husband god's gifted in in the field of business to be able to um to be able to uh show biblical principles in building up uh, a business in being able to um uh, financially provide maybe for certain ministries but as the wife may be a place of teaching right and and god's using both of them for kingdom purposes so it is it's not getting doing joint ventures or doing things that are both together it doesn't only mean that it doesn't only mean that but it means anything that god's calling them and supporting one another to fulfill the purpose and the grace and the gifting that god has put into each one each one's life okay so th the fact that uh, we need to understand that uh, um whenever god brings us together as people to get together as a couple he he brings us together for a purpose okay it's it's not just to um Uh, working for one another but it is for for greater causes uh, uh, he br he has brought us together for a purpose maybe for the children maybe for for a for a larger family or maybe for the church or maybe for the city maybe for the country or or some purpose that god wants around for us so it's just not for each other but also outwardly also to 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 look out outside because when you're looking at the commission the genesis commission it it says we are to be fruitful to multiply to fill to conquer and to have dominion in the earth right and this was a commission that was given to each one of us and we are to see how we are able to follow through this commission in the, in our lives right we we want to see god's rule extended through by our lives into the world that we we are in okay so because we are joint as the husband and the wife are joint as in the kingdom we share in the responsibilities of the kingdom we have a task to do right and we have also a toolkit that god has given us certain gifting certain calling certain uh uh certain things that that he's put in us in order for us to um fulfill the purposes that god's given so even as we pursue the purposes of god 
we need to also keep looking at each other, husband and wife keep looking at each other to support and encourage so that each of us can be released into what God wants for us, right? So in, in order for this to happen, um, uh, we need to first and foremost discover what that calling is, what those individual calling and vocation is. Okay? Uh, so the uh, as as we did we did speak about you know in First Corinthians we were talking about how each of us each of us are given a specific function in the body of Christ, and this with different spiritual gifts, with different anointing, with different giftings, and this um, is what he's gifted each one of us, anointed us so that we can use this to build the body of Christ, right? Rather than um, wanting our spouse to behave like us or be like us, it is important that we release them and encourage them to discover and pursue whatever callings and vocation that they they may have. Um, so in 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 sometimes you know even though there is a difference in what we are called or anointed with um it is to it is to bring us together okay we must learn how to complement one another as we fulfill this calling that god has called us to do so even if there are difference in the in the way that a husband and wife function like i said you know maybe one of the uh, partners in the marriage they may be in the business and one may be in full-time ministry this shouldn't be a cause for division or competition but it is something that we are it we create an opportunity support and encourage one another to do what uh, god's called us and blend in with that and complement complement one another as we as we uh, do that okay uh, right any questions up until now Mm, when okay. Uh, when God said to be fruitful and multiply, does it mean to have more children? Okay, so fruitful and multiply can have uh, very many different uh, meanings to it. Fruitful and multiply is is in one way yes to to expand uh, expand. Um, um, the commission that God's given you. Okay, so one of the ways in, when 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 God talked about being fruitful and multiply is to bring about His desire, His heart to those around. Right. So one of the things that when we're looking at the um, Genesis commission, um, are as a family. So let's let's just start as basic as that. As a family, when you're saying be fruitful and multiply, the first disciples that you create, that, that you have, is members of your own family, which means they're your children, right? And uh, we are to bring about God's love and God's word and, and, and our faith to, first and foremost, um, the very closest to us, which is our children. And from that, expand into other things. So although this, it, it seems like just like a physical connotation of having children, okay, and multiply. Yes, it does mean that. But in addition to it, it is to bring the rule of God, the reign of God uh, into the world, first and foremost, starting off with our children, first and foremost, starting off with our children. So that that's that's what God has called each one of us to do. And uh, I'm just going to um, uh, just going to refer something. Um, yeah. Um, uh, and I think I mentioned this in the initial uh, initial class, uh, which which I said was uh, the first and foremost ministry that each of us have is our marriage and our family. Right. And uh, after after our um, relationship with God, the the next most priority that God has put in our lives is the ministry that we have towards our marriage and towards our family, which means um, 
uh, which means that when when God has bought the man and the woman together, the order that God uh, the uh, order that God used was to have the family as the greatest priority. And if you look at uh, if you look at that verse Genesis 1, 27, 28, it says the male and fa uh, female he created them and he blessed them, which means God brings about a blessing on something that he's brought together. And then he says, be fruitful, multiply, fill, subdue. So the 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 commandment of of uh, um, of multiplying and fulfilling and uh, filling and subduing the earth comes from the togetherness of a husband and wife, which becomes the first ministry, and that gets carried on to the children. So, so whatever whatever God has brought together, we uh, this ministry of marriage should multiply first into our own homes, you know, into into our children knowing the Lord, and thereafter into into all the ends of the world. And that's what you will see in Matthew, right? Where uh, go make disciples of all, and and you see these two uh, actually blend so much, so well, one to another. So it just doesn't mean to have children, but that is one that that is an implication. But it is also to bring about the rule and reign of God first in our homes and then to the to the ends of the earth, to to all that around us. Then I hope that that uh, helps. Okay. Uh, oh, okay, there's another uh, question. Uh, if, uh, I think it's from Radha. Yeah, okay. If someone didn't get healed from their past and they get married, it can affect their marriage. And if the wife and husband is violating the marriage covenant secretly, but inside the home they're perfect spouse, what will be the consequence because it's hidden from them? Okay, I'm just wondering. Uh, this is just it's probably a random question and not um, related to the topic but i'll answer this if someone didn't get healed from their past and they get married it can affect their marriage yes it can uh, and i suppose your meaning maybe from a past relationship or um uh, a past emotional sexual connection that someone's have. I think that's what you you're probably referring to rather here. But yes, if you don't get healed from your past, you're carrying baggages into the marriage. It can affect your mar marriage. So yes, and if the wife or husband is violating the marriage covenant uh, secretly, but inside the home they're perfect spouse, what will be the con consequences because it's hidden from them? So. Anything that is a lie, anything that is done in deception, definitely is sin. Okay, so that in itself has its own consequences. Um, what are the consequences? The fact that um, at any point of time, when this comes open, when the uh, when the violation of the marriage covenant, right, is bought about in the open, trust gets lost, rejection happens, pain happens. Um, there is a lot of divide between the husband and the wife. So it's a messy situation, right? It's a difficult situation. Even though, even if it is done in secret, the person who is doing it in secret, yes, is answerable to God, is um, uh, can can be leading a lie, uh, a life of a lie and deception, being in the grapples and in the grasp of sin, making them more deceived, right? Because I mean, this is and an, it, and it's very true. I mean, there are many cases that you'd see like this. They feel that as long as they're not caught, it's okay, but but they are in a sense of deception. They have been deceived so much that they can't even recognize that they are in a plot of sin. So yes, consequences can be very many. It uh, leads to a lot of hurt, leads to mistrust. It leads to the breaking of family. It leads to significant, um, 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 you know, uh, so much so that even the turning back sometimes can be difficult. A reconciliation gets gets very difficult. So yes, it can hurt the marriage uh, rather.
Yes. Yes, Sri Dada. Okay, question. All right. Yeah. Um, I hope that answered your question. Okay. Yes, Dada? Is that okay? Okay. Uh, maybe I want to just add how do you. Now, it, there are two things. I think it's important if it's a believer, it's important to bring um, and bring and share the sin that he's in, okay, whichever he, she, whoever, the, whoever is violating the covenant, saying that, um, you know, just like uh, Nathan went to David, right, and shared with him, saying that, you know, this is a place that you, that's, that's not right for you. So it's important to do that. So if it's a believer, to let them know that they are um, not in a not in a good place and it can cause damage. So it is important to do that. If it's an unbeliever, it's important to ask them questions. You know, the fact that if they're doing something in secret, why would they do it in secret, right? And uh, um, if they are uh, uh, if if they're doing something in secret that the, that the other spouse doesn't want to know, then that in itself reveals that it isn't a helpful, it isn't a helpful engagement that they are in. So asking those questions for them to think about what could be, what what kind of position or heart position they are in, even as they are doing things in secret. And then of course the natural things of what could be certain consequences if the person were to get to know. So that's probably how you can you can do to help. I know they're not simple answers, but nevertheless, it's something that we can consider. OK? All right. Um, we'll, we'll move on. Uh, um, so even as we, we were talking about being in a team, I'd like to also probably share a couple more of thoughts, which is which is written over here. So often when, um, you know, when, when we go through life, especially in marriage, there are different seasons when, um, that, that we encounter, right? And these different seasons could be as a couple or as a family. Like one of the, se one of the things that you would find is um, right after marriage, when, when, we, when a couple has their children, they are in a different season, right? So which means some of the roles that both the couple were, were doing together changes, right? Maybe the wife who's been working maybe takes a break because of care of the of the children. Okay, so then she stays at home when the children are young and uh, does not work or does not get into a role of working or or you know providing for the family maybe, right? So in this season, in these differing seasons it's important to encourage and support through that season of life, okay? And uh, pitching in or helping each other through that time so that they could transition from one season to another, okay? Uh, also, um, not, not imposing what one may be experiencing at a certain, certain season, okay? Uh, uh, let's say wherever, wherever maybe the couple has a sense of the, uh, you know they, they're going through a certain person season maybe one person is going through a deep time of examining oneself right and really building their faith up whereas the other person may be at the peak of their spiritual journey with god and not expecting or imposing one's ideas and thoughts and getting them up to to change and to have the same journey like the other, right? But being able to um, encourage and cheer them as they are growing or as they are reflecting upon what God's doing in their life. So supporting and encouraging each other through whatever season they may be at. Also, um, it's important not to live uh, your life uh, impressing what other people want you to do. So you're not doing things to impress others, right? And not doing things to um, to get public applause, but you are doing things because the Lord 
has moved you in a special specific regard like and this especially with regard to those who are engaged in ministry you know like you would expect for maybe if there is a there is one of the family members or the or husband or wife who's involved in ministry the expectation is that the other partner or the other spouse also should be in some ministry or the children should follow the same path um, the goal the goal is never to impose or uh, impress upon upon an expectation you know that they should all follow what one member of the family has followed because we understand that god's called each one differently and getting them to support people in that is what is needed so not living to impress others or satisfy someone else's expectations or rather to do only what god has called us to do okay uh, through even even in um, you know as we are uh, working through um, especially for those in ministry to be able to balance uh, your time in as a family as well as your priority so it's important that you that you do that because sometimes it can take so much of time we tend to neglect other parts of the of our um, of our priorities maybe it's the home or it's the it's the marriage or the family but being able to um, balance these priorities two other things that i just want to bring up when we're looking at teamwork is praying together as well as bringing up children praying together as scripture brings about when two or three when two or more are gathered in his name he will be in their midst so one of the most powerful things um is family prayers togetherness is consistently coming together in the family altar so setting up a time to pray um to read the word uh, to worship together to maybe discuss about god's word uh, so that uh, you know you, you grow together because there's a lot of power you bring down the glory of god as you're praying together and the other thing is uh, bringing up children in uh, bring up children together now bringing up children definitely needs a team right um, it, it is not it it is uh, needed that looking after the children does not remain the sole responsibility of one of the of the uh, partners or it's left to another institution like church or like the aunt the uncle the neighbors okay but it is something that we are called to do and and that's that's where uh, you know uh, uh, rin when you did when you did talk about i was talking about this it is the genesis com commission is he makes he he tells adam and eve to be fruitful and replenish the earth which means you have a duty in bringing up and training and caring for the child so that that is where you're setting up um ways of nurturance in order to bring up the children so that this Uh, bringing up children again is a teamwork in their discipline in their daily health in their walk with god in their academics in their calling in their um uh, in in everything in life it requires them to be a team together okay um yeah so we've we've come to the end of that chapter we've spoken about what the power of a team is we've spoken about um, what are some of the hindrances that we see in becoming a good team <clears throat> what are some of the factors that make a good team the heart attitudes of a good team how do you become a good team following the kingdom of god uh, what are the callings and the vocation we may have how do we blend it together how we nurture and encourage one another and we spoke also of how being a team together uh, uh, praying together and bringing up children is also part of uh, becoming a good team okay um yes we have 5 minutes any questions uh, with this regard or any reflections if any of you would like to share your thoughts or your understanding that would also help any thoughts Okay then we'll let's close with a word of prayer can i ask uh, one of the students to please close with prayer please
Prabhu, Prabhu Manikim, would you like to close with a word of prayer? Okay, Prabhu is in there. I don't, don't. Uh, anybody else? I'll pay Yeah, go ahead. go ahead. Jesus, we thank you for this uh, time that we had to um, learn uh, about how we can uh, grow in our marriage um, and um, how we can work together as a team to fulfill your kingdom, to fulfill your will, your purpose that you have um, planned out for us, Father. And Lord, I pray that um, we would uh, remember what we have been taught and that we will be able to apply it into our lives. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Thank you all. Just a reminder for all of you to please uh, complete your uh, online students, please complete your assessments before tomorrow. Um, E-learning students, you have time uh, till the end of the course. Okay, uh, Online students, please ensure that you do that by tomorrow. Thank you. Have a blessed day. Meet you next week.